Good morning and welcome to Leatherwood. Here's what you need to know. If you're a first time guest or a recent guest, we hope you felt welcome as you entered in today. Guests, we have one request of you and that is as you leave today, if you wouldn't mind taking your worship guide or a guest card, filling that out, taking it out to our lobby and exchanging that for a gift from us. Here at Leatherwood, we believe that small groups are the strength of our church, and all of our small groups are now meeting at the 10 o'clock hour, so if you're not sure what class you would be in, you can go out to our lobby, there's a board on the wall there, or you can go on our website and look at our offerings, pick a class, make a plan, and join us for our next gathering. Here at Leatherwood, we have a new member slash prospective members class called Discover Leatherwood. It meets with a pastor and other staff for a session, we provide lunch, we answer any questions that you have about our church give you some great resources. So, so if you're not sure what your next step is here at our church, it could be that class. How do you get in it? You just see me or one of the other staff members and say, I want to be in that next Discover Leatherwood class and we'll make sure that that happens. Here at Leatherwood, we have many easy ways to give. So please pick the way that's best for you. You can give online at our website, easytide.com backslash LBCAL. You can give in the offering plates as you leave today. You can drop it by the church or mail it in and thank you church for a great year so far in your generosity. March 14th is just around the corner and we're going to be having a men's breakfast. So men, make sure to be inviting all of your friends and your sons to that. We're looking forward to a great turnout and a great message. So please make sure to put that on your calendar and join us. Once again guests, we want to thank you so much for being here today. We know that you have options and we don't take it lightly that you've chosen to worship with us today. On Wednesday nights, we have what we call family night, and we have something for all ages, nursery all the way up. That starts at 630. We would love for you and your family to join us. But once again, guests, thank you for being here today, and we cannot wait to see you next week. excited about that and to see what the Lord begins to do in her life. Merely in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and upon your profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Garrett Saxon this past Wednesday night in our uh, gathering for the children. Uh, he expressed his need to be born again. One of our leaders uh, helped him, assisted him, and prayed with him. He received Christ and Bray followed up and met with him afterwards. So we're very fired up about him. Very bright young man. He's going to be something for the Lord and, and very outgoing. So I know he's going to use his witness. Garrett, uh, upon the command from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and you professing him as, as Lord of your life, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. That's an awesome way to start a service. Amen. Let's give the Lord one more hand this morning. Stand and worship with us this morning. So glad to see you here at Leatherwood. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my till I.
something wrong with you. Praise God. Praise God.
praise you. Give the Lord a hand this morning. He's so worthy to be praised. Amen. You may be seated.
job again today. Thank y'all so much for all that you do and blessing us with your wonderful uh, spiritual talent. Thank you so much for that. I heard an old preacher say many, many years ago, as we study the persecuted church, Smyrna, Revelation chapter 2, he said he he held up a a tea bag and he said, you know, this is a very uh, irrelevant thing. Until you put it in hot water. Once you put it in hot water, you begin to smell the fragrance. It it becomes very useful. The church in America and mostly in all the West, we have been useful in that we've reached people. But I'm telling you, it's fastly coming where the church in America is going to consistently find itself in hot water. Now, I'm talking about the real church. I'm talking about the one that doesn't just get behind a podium and spout words, but as we leave in our cars and we go home, we actually practice what we preach. That's the church that's going to be in hot water very, very soon in America, and we need to understand how really exciting that is. What an awesome opportunity to finally be the real church, the persecuted church, the one, by the way, that our Savior promised was coming. Isn't it it exciting to know that we're soon going to be acquainted with the grief 
that our Savior and, the, and that our fathers and mothers in the faith suffered, we're very soon coming to where we're going to be under that type of persecution. If you will stand, let's read Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, now remember this is Jesus, if you will, dictating to John what to write. These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works. Tribulation. Now, this word tribulation is not talking about the seven years of tribulation. It actually means pressure. Pressure. The picture that I got when I pulled up the meaning was, you know, when they would, in the old days, they'd fill a big vat full of grapes, and someone would go in, two or three people, and go in, and they would mash the grapes with their feet. That's the picture of the pressure that the church is under here. Poverty. But you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Lord, thank you for a wonderful day. Already been so awesome. Two young folks who gave their life to Christ was able to to follow your commands and baptize them. And Lord, what wonderful time of worship we've had. Lord, now we're opened up your holy book. And Lord, it's infallible. Help us, God, to preach what you've called us to preach. Help us to listen and help us to apply in our lives as we leave this place And, Lord, no matter what comes to us in the next few years, next few days, however long it might be, help us to stand faithful. And, and Lord, you find us faithful when you come back. And I know what an eternal blessing that will be to us and to you. Save someone today, God, according to your glory and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. John 15, 20. This is Jesus making a promise to the coming church. He said... Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And notice what he said in verse 21, John 15. They do these things because they don't know him who sent me. In other words, they do these things to the church, to my followers, to me, as he was saying, he was about to be crucified. Simply because they are unsaved. They are not spiritually discerning people. It would be impossible for them to, to understand spiritual things and to treat spiritual people uh, in spiritual ways because they're not spiritual. Jesus died by crucifixion. So did Peter. Upside down. Andrew the same. James, son of Zebedee, was beheaded. John died of old age, exiled on an island. We read, as we read the Revelation, we understand he was on an island as he wrote it. Matthew was martyred in Ethiopia as he's expanding the church. Bartholomew crucified after being beaten. Philip was crucified. Thomas was killed with a spear. Simon the Zealot crucified. James was stoned. Thaddeus stoned. Paul was beheaded about the same time that Peter was crucified about a year apart now the city Smyrna though the the name Smyrna uh, comes from the word myrrh and myrrh is something that they were the leading exporter of in that part of the world at that time and it was used for perfume and also embalming so it is connected with death inside Smyrna is very beautiful port city but inside Smyrna there were six temples that were built for gods who are uh, myth- mythological uh, gods, in those temples occurred sensual pagan activity. That was a part of their gathering, part of their so-called worship. They hated Christianity, not just because what was preached down the street, but the practice of those who came out of the meeting was counter to the culture of the folks in Smyrna. As a matter of fact, while all that's going on with this type of worship in the city. The emperor of Rome, uh, one of ten, by the way, who in a row 
declared himself to be God and declared that he wanted to be worshipped, uh, they said, no, we only bow to Jesus. So understand why the Christians in Smyrna were hated and why they were persecuted is because they refused to bow down to any made-up God or any man who called himself God, and they lived counter to the culture all around them. It was the most persecuted of all the seven churches that we will study. It is believed that it also represents a period of time in church history where uh, it was the most persecuted time for the church. Beginning in about A.D. 100 and going through A.D. 314, five million Christians lost their lives to persecution because they gathered and refused to bow down to the emperor of Rome and for other reasons as well. This letter that arrived in Smyrna arrived there uh, somewhere around 95 or 96 A.D. I'm very interested lately, and, and here's, here's the thing we need to understand in modern Christianity and, and trying to uh, understand what persecution is and isn't and all that kind of stuff. I, the argument's out there all the time, uh, especially right now. There's a, a pastor up in Canada who's sitting in jail this morning, and I, I trust that his church met anyway. And I'll tell you something else. I will go out on the limb and say if they met today and the pastor is in jail, I'll almost guarantee you somebody will get saved in that church today just based on praying for the church and praying for the pastor and praying that things go on like they're supposed to do, whether the pastor's behind the pulpit or not. Now here's what the pastor uh, Coates said in his last sermon before they uh, arrested him a few days later. He said, I'll leave it up to Jesus what real persecution is. That's not relevant to me whether what I'm about to go through is persecution or not. That's up to Jesus to decide that. But I have decided I'm not going to let the unsaved tell me how many people we can put in the house of God. That's what it came down to. It came down to they wanted him to limit it to 15%. By the way, as I would guess right now, if we were going by 15%, at least 60% of y'all would have to leave immediately. So understand, uh, common sense told me to set it at about 25%, and we flirt with 30 every once in a while. But thankfully, we're in a, such a backward state. I thank God for being in Alabama, by the way. And, and some people pick on our governor. I think she's done a great job by staying out of it the most that she can. That's the way she needed to do. We got what we call common sense in this part of the country. You know what the virus would do. I know what the virus would do. You choose to be here or you stay home watching online. I choose to open the doors because I think we're going to be just fine. So far, haven't we done great as the body of Christ? So, we've got to be careful when we say something is persecution, something isn't. All I know is back in the summer in Alberta where the good pastor sitting in a jail this morning, they released 35% of their inmates to protect them from the virus. I guess that's enough room to put a preacher back in there, right? So he's sitting in jail when 35% of the inmates are sitting at home. So you decide whether what he's going through is uh, persecution or not. You, I know some of you probably are saying, well, Brother Mike, all he had to do was follow the rules. And very soon, listen to me, the rules are going to come out in this country. You think I'm kidding you. Uh, just look who we put over health and human services. We put somebody over health and human services, which they're supposed to see about us in general, about our health and human service, that it's a man who thinks he's a woman. Do you feel real good about the decisions that he will make uh, for our nation? I don't. One of the things that's going to happen in the schools in our nation, and again, Alabama be the last, hallelujah. We're also the last to get a lottery, hallelujah. Rich getting richer, poor getting poor. So anyway, some of y'all disagree with that. That's fine too. We've got enough things to be addicted to in this state. We don't need more help. Oh, it's for the kids. Yeah, I know. Very soon, some children will be sitting in school in America and if they repeat what Jesus said, that God only made men 
and women, you'll have to go pick up your child or grandchild from school because they broke a rule that somebody, who would put that rule into place in the United States of America? That we can't say things about people even though it's true. He is a man every day of the week. He just needs to act like one. We've been blessed so long in the West because, let me tell you why we've been blessed. We had men and women who were willing to die that we could have freedom of religion. But we, our generation and those following us, were begging to give it back away. We're begging. But let me say this to you before I, this is the introduction, I'm about to finish. Whether we have freedom to worship or not, Jesus said, show up. He didn't say to Smyrna, oh baby, I'm going to fix it and make everything right. He said no, as a matter of fact. And he didn't say live your best life now. He said it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse is what Jesus said. And I'll say to you, suck it up buttercup. It's about to get worse. <laughs> but we're finally going to have that fragrance about us that our sisters and brothers across the ocean have been going through since, since Jesus left here. We're finally going to start tasting that, that they have experienced. Let me give you three very quick truths that we got to hold on to in these last days. Number one, Jesus is the sole proprietor or owner and the life of the church. Just because we show up and call ourselves the church, if Jesus isn't running things, we're not doing real church stuff. I don't know what it is we're doing, but, but it's the warm and fuzzies, I guess. But in order to really do church, Jesus has got to be acknowledged as the owner. And he is the life of the church. Here's what he said in verse 8. I'm the first and the last. What does that mean? I started this thing called life. And I will say when history is over and time is no more. In the meantime, you personally and me, we're going to be, we want to be in his book, okay? We want to be in his history, not outside his history. We want to claim his blood and be written down as one of those, one of those who believe that Jesus is the only way back to God. He never promised to make things better. He promised to never leave us. And he promised to be with us through the suffering that is called Christianity. The church historically has been under persecution. We need to understand that. It's a basically it's still a new thing that the church could come and have a good time and have fellowships and, and eat together and, and sing and, and uh, you know have, have various things outside with no fear. It's still a very new thing. And we need to be thankful for the times that we've had. But they're coming to an end at some time. I think I'll see them in my lifetime. I'm sure my kids will and their grandkids. And we need to have them prepared for the suffering. Christ is alive. So no matter what the church goes through, we need to act like it. Here's the deal. If we had closed our church like still many are, and many of them in places they could open with no problem, uh, uh, would, uh, listen, would little Garrett got saved if we hadn't had Wednesday nights? By the church, what way church, we have Wednesday nights, okay? It's a very vital time for your family. If you're not working and you can come or you can drive at night, it's a powerful thing to do to come and attend on Wednesday night. Uh, Bray said this one time, and I've been thinking about it ever since. He says, you know, over 60% of the people that get saved that are kids or students get saved on Wednesday night. That's why it's so important for us to get it back open. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus basically said, I will build my church. It is not the pastor's church. It is not one of the deacons' church. It is Jesus' church. And he saves sinners one at a time. One at a time. And, he, and they become living stones. And they are, they are built and set in a certain way that, that they do what they're called to do and cut out to do, and that's what makes the church strong. Jesus is the owner and the life of the church. Forty years ago, 45 years ago, J. Vernon McGee, I read, 
actually went to where Smyrna used to be. It's been renamed now for a different city. And he said even 45 years ago, the church still existed there, but they would hide. He had the privilege of meeting the pastor of the church there in Smyrna, and he would say, well, we're, we're just about totally underground, even at this point in our history. J. Vernon McGee said this, the persecuted believers needed to know that Jesus was the one in charge and that the persecution was in the planning and the purpose of God. We do not put our heads down in fear and shame. We keep going, keep your head up. You're born again. No devil in hell can take away your eternal life from you. So keep your head up and whatever you have to go through at work, at school, wherever you are, keep your head up and keep proclaiming the name of Jesus. Second truth very quickly today. There's only one way to become a member of Jesus' church. Jesus said, you know, some of the folks who are pretending to be real Jews are not real Jews. Now let's get it in our head what he means by real Jews. Peter was a Jew who received Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Now that's a real Jew in, in Jesus' eyes. It is those that, yeah, they, they're Jewish by nationality, yes. They might be Jewish by faith. But if they don't receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they're going to the same hill as everybody else. We need to understand that. You go to Israel right now, you'll find one of the most atheistic nations in all the world. Just because they live in Israel don't mean they're going to heaven. they got to plead the blood of Christ just like you did. You need to understand. The real Jew are the ones who believe Jesus Christ is the only way to be reconciled back to God. Everyone else is just religious, a Jew in religion or a Jew by nation, even a Jew by, by covenant, but that covenant is not going to be eternal if they don't receive Christ into their lives and into their heart. I was dead, but I came to life. No doubt some of the folks in Smyrna, their family, had been beaten to death or killed, and Jesus wanted them to know, I died too, but I came to life. So those who die because of me and their faith, they're going to live again one day. Notice what else that he said. He said, I was alive, I died, but now I'm alive again. That is the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. Now this is the same, uh, this is the same gospel that Jesus lived and died. And then Peter and those guys began to preach. And when Paul got saved, Saul got saved, name was changed to Paul. The church fathers told him, they had a little meeting with him and this is what they told him. Now listen here, we're going to tell you what the gospel is. We're going to tell you one time. And you better go out and preach this gospel. And he did. And guess what? I was given the same gospel almost 25 years ago, and here's what the deacons of this church told me, and here's what the guys who were on that committee told me. There ain't but one gospel. And Mike, you better preach that gospel. It, this is one way you'll get fired if you stop preaching this gospel. One day I'll pass it on to the next guy, and here is the gospel. I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the Scripture. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what? I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God to all that believe, to the Jew and to the Greek. He said, all of y'all, all the folks sitting in the church are not true believers, is what he said. He might even be talking about a congregation down the road. We don't know. But he said, now they meet and they call themselves true believers, but they're not. They, they sit in the church and Jesus is very rarely mentioned because they're afraid. They're afraid that someone will come and persecute them. Or they're afraid the very mention that Jesus is the only way to heaven will offend some. Whatever the reason is, people have gone silent. And some of them are sitting in so-called churches today. And Jesus' name will not be brought up because it's offensive that he's the only way back to God. Outside the church, Satan has his forces. They're against us all the time, you notice. 
But guess what? Inside the church sometimes there are forces too that try to hinder the work of the gospel. I'm thankful to pastor church that for the most part will stand with its pastor as long as he stays faithful in the word of God. It always has. I figure you, you'll continue to, right? No matter what happens, you continue to follow in the word of God. It should be to the place that this morning as this pastor is in jail that one of the Sunday school teachers, if had to be, could stand up and teach the same gospel as the pastor had taught just a few weeks ago. That's a, that's a mature church, and that is what I'm sure is being done this morning. A.T. Pearson said this, The peace of God is that eternal calm which lies far too deep in the praying, trusting soul to be reached by any external disturbances. No matter what's going on in the world, we are peace. We're at peace with God. And we know we'll wake up in God's heaven one day no matter what happens to us down here. Here's the final truth. The church that has been tested is the church that can be trusted. The church that has been tested is the church that can be trusted. Jesus said, I, I know your works. I, I'm watching. I, I know you're going through pressure. I know that you've lost your jobs. Poverty, what does that mean? It, it is believed that, that almost everybody in that city, males especially, belong to some type of, of guild. Uh, today we'd probably call it a union. But to work with their, uh, their hands, to make things out of silver and various metals. And, or maybe they, uh, they were skilled in, in making the perfume and various things with the, the, the myrrh. But because they were Christian, they got fired. And they were told to go home. And, and they're poor. They have no support from the government. They have no support from anyone because everyone is afraid to support them. Jesus says, I know that you're impoverished in Smyrna. But I want you to know something. In heaven, you're rich. We keep an account in heaven. And in heaven, you're rich. You've done what you're supposed to do. I know those outside who blaspheme, who say that there's been a spiritual work done in their life, but there hasn't been. They have never been saved. But they keep saying Sunday after Sunday that there's been a spiritual work in their life, that the Holy Spirit of God has infilled them and uses them, and, and they walk with Him, but they don't. They never even pay Him any attention. They're just, they're just lying. We need to understand that a rose puts out the strongest fragrance when it is crushed. The church is the best when people tell us we can't do church, okay? How many people, what, I, I told this, uh, I don't know if I told all of the congregation or not, but I told a few people, it was one Sunday during that two-month time when we were down, and I would come down every Sunday, we, Bray and I, Bray would, he was so uh, gracious and set us up a, green room and we would go in there and we would record our stuff and little praise team may pack in there and, and uh, you know if we were going to die of the virus it'd have been then right i mean anyway that's the only way we could do it we didn't have any means of recording we, he would record off his phone until we got more technology i'd come down here every that'd be a thursday or so we do that i'd come down here every sunday by myself wouldn't be a soul down here i'd be in my office I'll be honest with you, cuss word for a preacher to say, I was depressed, give me a break. I'm in my office, I try to get started on the sermon for the next Thursday. I pre, you know, we wa I watched the thing I, I, online that day. I get a phone call, it's a phone, on my phone, I don't know who this is, on his number. And they, they say, can I come see you? Well, I had to ask you, who is this? Well, she told me who it was, I said, well, bring you. I knew the young lady, I said, sure. Bring your boyfriend. I'm down here by myself. They, they come in my office and she received Christ in my office. You know what that told me? Open the stinking door. That's what it told me. Get the doors open. The first Sunday we met, I saw a baby that wasn't two or three weeks old as mom brought him through the doors. I said, we're going to survive and we're going to thrive. As a matter of fact. The church that's been tested is the church 
that you can trust. Hebrews 12, 1, 2, Shane comes and gets ready for a time of response. Here's basically what it says. You know what? We have such a great group of examples to go by. People that would not give up, though they were told to shut up. That we have to go forward, we have to go on and continue to share the Word of God. Here's what Jesus promised the church at Smyrna. Number one, I'll give you a crown. It makes me want to reveal what's under my thing. I, well, I come close. Nah, not this week. That, that crown is the crown that the bride wore at the wedding feast. And here's what he else he said. He who is born once will die twice. He who is born twice will die once. D.L. Moody, what is he saying? Jesus said you won't be hurt by the second death. What does that mean? When I come to judge the world for their unbelief, the believer will not die that second death. They're only going to die one physical death. And the rest of their life is eternal. And they will be alive. But those who reject Christ as Lord and Savior will not only die physically, but they will experience eternal death in a place called hell. That was designed for Satan and his followers, not for human beings that that God wants to redeem. Would you pray with me right now? I want you to consider something right now. You're here today. God's got you here by his providence. His, His care brought you here today now here's what he is saying here's what Lord Jesus Christ said there are two deaths for the unbeliever and some of those unbelievers were sitting in churches as he described to Smyrna the two deaths for the unbeliever is physical and spiritual for the believer those that have been washed in the blood of Christ they have one funeral for us And everybody that gathers around on those sad days in their heart, they know that believer is in the presence of a holy God. That's what Paul wrote. Be absent from the body, be present with the Lord. That means they'll never go through that judgment seat that casts people into the place called hell. Because they believe Jesus took their punishment on an old cross. They buried him. And he rose on the third day. It's called faith. You're here today. And it's time for you to express your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I want to ask you as we stand, step out. Let us help you start your journey in Christ. Doors of church are open. God has sent you here. We want you here. Any way we can get you started, please come. Lord, save someone to your glory today. Bless the rest of us. As we follow you in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. If you have a need today, step out and come. Maybe you just need to come and pray. Whatever need you have today, please come. I hear the Savior say, My strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and this awesome song right here. Amen. One of the most scriptural songs you'll ever hear. Let's Jesus see.
paid it all. Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And when before the